Hello, my name is Jade Powers, Assistant Curator at the Kemper Museum of Contemporary Art. Um, and I'm also the curator of Diani Whitehawk speaking to relatives. I just would like to say welcome and thank you for joining us virtually at Kemper Museum for Diani Whitehawk speaking to relatives talk and tour with Gaylene Krauser. Gaylene Krauser is a member of the Standing Rock Sioux Tribe and has served as the executive director of the Heart of America Indian Center, Kansas City Indian Center since 2012. She previously served on its board of directors and volunteered as a youth camp counselor. She currently serves on a task force with the State of Missouri Children's Division regarding the Indian Child Welfare Act the local board of FEMA's emergency food and shelter program, and on the board of Tataka uh, Luda, a nonprofit youth serving organization on the Cheyenne River Reservation. Gaylene is a former paralegal with years of experience assisting attorneys practicing in contract, family, and employment law. Kemper Museum would like to thank Jack and Karen Holland for their support of the Visiting Artists Program. Their generosity makes it possible for Kemper Museum to continue to have thoughtful and engaging programs in conjunction with our exhibitions and projects. Thank you to our Kemper Museum docents who offer so much of their time and expertise in interpreting the exhibitions and permanent collection with such great energy and enthusiasm. Underwriting for the docent program is generously provided by the family of Mary Beth Smith. A special thank you to those who supported the exhibition, Diani Whitehawk Speaking to Relatives, Kemper Family Foundations, National Endowment of the Arts, and the Missouri Arts Council. Kemper Museum is sponsoring this program in partnership with the Missouri Humanities Council and with support from the National Endowment for the Humanities and many more. And a warm thank you to our Kemper Museum members. Your support of the museum helps to make all of our exhibitions and programs free. If you are not yet a member, it is easy to sign up. You can visit our website at www.kemperart.org. Thank you so much. And it is a great pleasure to welcome Gaylene Krauser. And um, if you have any questions as the program goes on, please feel free to type them in the chat and we will answer them at the end of the program. Good day, relatives. I greet you with a happy heart and a warm handshake. Um, my name is Gaylene Krauser, and I'm um, the executive director at the Kansas City Indian Center. I'm a citizen of the Standing Rock Sioux Tribe and Unkwapa, Oglala, and Yangtone. Um, and it's my pleasure to, to be with you this afternoon. Um, I just want to start by sharing a little bit about the Kansas City Indian Center. Um, this is our 50th year anniversary of um, incorporation as a nonprofit here in Kansas City. So we've been serving the pet metropolitan area um, since 1971. And the population has grown significantly since the founding. Uh, we were actually created as Heart of America Indian Center and it was um, in response to the to the relocation and termination policies um, in the 50s and 60s that made Indian people, Native Americans, relocate to urban areas. And so there were a number of those cities across the nation. Um, but Kansas City being in the middle, we've we've got a lot of folks here. According to the 2010 census, we have about 30,000 people that identify as um, Native American on, um, on that census and from nearly 100 tribes. And so we have um, uh, quite a lot of people that we serve here in our various capacities. Our, our largest 
function here is as a social service agency. We provide uh, food pantry and emergency assistance and uh, case management. We do behavioral health and counseling. We do group counseling. And, um, and then we, um, in response to COVID, we've been doing a lot more um, things in that avenue to try to prevent its spread. So, you know, we've been passing out masks and um, hand sanitizer and cleansers and stuff like that, along with um, food pantries and, and to um, the clients that, that come here. And we're, we're still serving folks. We're doing it a little bit differently, mostly curbside, just to um, and by appointment, just to make sure that our, our clients and staff stay, stay safe. Um, and as we slowly open up, um, well, I'm sure we'll continue to do that uh, by appointment for a while. We, we provide cultural services too, but um, those have mostly been virtual. So we're, we're really happy to have opportunities like this to, to partner with um, other organizations that are providing virtual cultural services and um, presentations and that sort of thing. Um, normally we would have um, a monthly meeting and gatherings and that sort of thing. We'd be having our youth night and youth programming. Um, but, you know, most of that is all virtually done now, as is our camp. This will be our 40th year hosting a youth camp that's uh, five days, four nights. And um, unfortunately, last year we, we had to do it virtually and when we're planning on doing it virtually again this year, too. So uh, we still want to be able to to connect with our kids and make sure that they're learning about their culture and, and doing activities that make them proud of who they were created to be. And um, so we're looking forward to doing that. And then we, we do advocacy work here, um, including like Jade said, um, serving on steering committees and um, with the state on Indian child welfare and families and juvenile courts and that sort of thing. Um, we also do um, serve on committees like the complete count committee for census to make sure that we are we you know we're we're being counted uh, here in the metro and um, doing voter registration and education and outreach and things like that um, to make sure our voices are heard and and various other ways that um, so that we're being seen and heard and our voices are being heard and we're being included um, in things that are important to us in the community. So um, that's what we do here at the Kansas City Indian Center among, among other things that I'm, I'm sure I'm forgetting about, but uh, it's really a, a good place for people to connect with the community and to find out about things that are going on um, in the metropolitan area and um, and and ways that they can stay connected. Okay, uh, Jade's running the slideshow for me, so <laughs> she's driving. So I'm going to say next slide, please. And so here's where I want to give just great thanks to the Kemper for bringing this exhibit, Yana Whitehawks exhibit, to Kansas City. Um, it's so important that we can be seen in these spaces where typically we're not seen and we're not included. Um, normally, you know, anytime we see anything in a museum, you know, we're behind the glass um, more as relics and not as the vibrant living people that we are and, and the contributions that we make to society. And um, that's particularly true in Kansas City. Uh, that, that's one of the things that um, um, the Indian Center has been part of, uh, particularly the last few years, is um, the mascot issue because we're, you know, we're seen in in those stereotypical ways, and and it's time to change that. We we need to be seen for for the people that we are, for the human beings that we are, instead of being, you know, relegated to caricatures, and so. It's, it's through programs like this where um, 
where we're being seen in these spaces with our contemporary achievements um, that really uh, make me grateful to live in Kansas City in a place um, that has a, a museum like the Kemper, where indigenous artists can can showcase their um, can showcase their art. And then you know, great big thank you to to Deani Whitehawk for you know doing this fantastic job of blending our traditional art and our our mo and modern art. You know, bringing old and new and indigenous and non-indigenous styles together and representing us in in this way that's that's so thought provoking because there there are so few of us that you know kind of anytime one of us is out here in a public facing way so whether it's me as the executive director or diani as the as a contemporary artist you know we're, we're representing our people and hopefully in a, in a really good way because uh, because there are you know our population numbers are so low we might be the only indigenous person people have met or talked to or or seen and so it is kind of a burden on our shoulders to make sure that we're always doing things in a good way and and being good relatives and being seen like that because um because it might be the only time people have that interaction and so i just uh wopi latanka to diani for for doing this like this and um and, and and putting this out there um some of the things that struck me and and i've seen this this uh this sweethearts this uh chante Scuya painting uh, on the advertisements and i thought oh wow this is really cool but when the staff and i went and did the um did the tour i, I was just absolutely blown away by this painting and um if you have any opportunity at all to go in and see this exhibit in person, you really should uh, do yourself a favor and do that. Um, there were a couple paintings that I really had to, to just marvel at and even look at from the side because they had such depth. Um, they were 3D even. So we were looking at it like, really is there, you know, is it a multimedia where it's, um, where it is got a mixed media and it's three dimensional and that sort of thing. And so I'd look at it from the front and I'd go to the side and I'd look at it. And this is, this is an oil on our, our um, acrylic on canvas, but the, the quill work, uh, particularly that blue just pops off of that canvas and it's just incredible to see. And so, um, the geometric designs um, that are are typically Lakota, uh, and how we did things in in our artwork and um, beadwork and quill work and that sort of thing, she really represented them well um, on these um, in these paintings and in, in all her art here and um, and brought it together with the the typically modern abstract that. Um, I think really showcased it well that that you could see that that it's modern, um, but also the um, traditional geometry, and and it just really it just really struck me and it touched me in a way that um, that that I was just so appreciative of having that opportunity to see it. Um, so anyway, next slide. <laughs> So um, this is the uh, the carry three that she did, and it's um, I want to say it's a copper pot's not the right word vessel, you know, with the with the copper dipper, and it's just beautifully um, beaded, just completely throughout, and it, it, with the with the long fringe, the long buckskin, and it's just incredibly beautiful. And, and, and it just blew me away. You know, I can imagine the time and the patience that it took to, to bead that and to, to put that together. 
and when I was when I was looking at it and thinking about what they had said about the reason that she did it that way, it's because that was now a piece of art for art's sake. And and so you know it leads you to that question of what is art? And a lot of times things like like this particular pot, this particular uh, carrying vessel, this water bucket, um, you know, normally, you know, it would be used to, to drink water from or in some of our sacred ceremonies. So um, like the Native American church and stuff like that um, for, for the medicine in there, in those ceremonies, but she's created it in such a way that, that now it's no longer functional for that. And that is what sets it apart from what's typically considered art and what's typically considered um, a craft and, a, you know, and then decorative art. And so, so many times because our people have decorated things that are functional in ways that were absolutely art and absolutely visionary and incredible works. They were, were not considered that because they had another function other than just being art. So, you know, unless it was um, something like this creation or a painting uh, it was never considered fine art. It was never considered um, anything other than a craft. Um, next slide, please. So for example, these uh, moccasins, um, I just found them on, on the internet, just a quick little um, Google search of, of moccasins, beaded moccasins. So it, on this auction site, it doesn't say um, how old they are, but I can tell by looking at them that they're old. And the yellow beads um, are, are a type that are, are older and um, the geometry of them and, and the wear, you can tell that they're older beads. And someone put a lot of time into beading these. And to me, they, they are very artful. But I recall when I first started here as the executive director, one of one of my big functions is getting funding for the programs that we want to do. And one of the things that I wanted to do was um, have these classes to teach people how to do moccasins and how to do the beadwork on them and and um, teach them about these kinds of things. And we were turned down and said that we should not apply for an art grant that we should apply for um, art or uh, for craft, you know, which was a significantly less funding. Um, and they just considered it a craft. And, and I just, I was actually kind of offended because to me watching all, you know, all the people that I know that do this kind of art and the time that it takes and the dedication and the perseverance. I'm like, how, how can you say that's not art? That everything they had to do to line all that up and make it beautiful. Um, I, I just could not see the difference. And so, um, so when, when Diani took that her last piece, that carrier piece and made it so that it's not functional, so it can only be perceived as art, I thought that that was a good way to challenge that perception of everything that we do, just because we can use it for something, doesn't mean that it's not, um, that it's not a piece of art. And so we were talking, when I, when I, uh, when I searched this out, I, I actually looked for the ones with the with the crosses on it, because, you know, when we're talking about symbols, it, it means something different to me um, and probably to indigenous audiences than it would mean to people that don't know much about um, symbols. And, and it varies so much from tribe to tribe, from family to family, from individual to individual you know, symbols and the colors and that sort of thing. It means different things um, 
across the board, but there are some symbols that are, are so often used hmm, not, that um, they're a little more where, where you, I always just assume that they mean what, what I see them for. And so the cross like that um, is the directions, you know, it symbolizes the directions, you know, north, south, east, west, like that. And um, and then also the uh, the triangles that face each other like that, you know, the, the um, as above, so below, you know, it represents the universe and the earth, you know, and the, and that they're representative, they're mir they're mirrored each other. So, what exists in the earth exists in the in the sky in the universe. So, I'm not sure I'm explaining it correctly <laughs> because there there's so much depth to these symbols that you could really have a whole presentation just on, you know, what those two particular symbols mean. But you'll see those a lot, those geometrical symbols in, uh, particularly in Lakota um, art and beadwork and, um, you know, from, from way back. Um, so whether it's quilled um, or beaded or sewn or designed, um, you'll see those and and the symbols just they mean a whole lot to our culture and um, where other folks I know have described it like as an hourglass and I can see that too but um, but that's not what it means to me as a Lakota woman so okay next slide okay so um, part of the exhibit includes all those different indigenous languages that we were given an opportunity to listen to. Um, and absolutely beautiful languages. Um, and unfortunately, most of them are endangered. Uh, there aren't a lot of folks that still speak fluently and um, and some of them are already extinct. But um, as an urban person, I've been given the opportunity to hear several of those languages here at the center. Um, so whether it's people introducing themselves or giving a prayer, um, I've been able to hear uh, Ojibwe and Kiwan, uh, uh, Dene, Lakota, but some of them were, um, were new to me and, and very beautiful to listen to. And, and and it is a shame that in this in on this land that they are so foreign to people's ears and i just am grateful that that this exhibit is it exists to draw attention to that to draw attention to these indigenous languages that people don't usually get to hear um particularly if they don't live in the area where those those languages are spoken frequently so you know um on the navajo reservation to hear the Diné being spoken or or up in the great lakes region to hear the ojibwe or um you just don't hear it as much uh, in these urban settings um except that I've been fortunate, you know, and sometimes it's even through Zoom of having some Zoom, um, various national um, organizations where we can come together and hear each other uh, speaking that. And I don't always understand it, but it, it, it really 
stirs your your spirit to hear a language that's from here and unfortunately there is not the resources being dedicated to it that were dedicated to taking it away and uh, assimilating indigenous people uh, and it wasn't until 1990 that they even recognized that it was a bad thing to take these languages away from people but they really are so much of our culture that if you take the language um, we're, we're really losing a whole lot and that's one of the things like like at the UN when they even recognize a people that's one of the things that they have to have they have to have a language and they have to have land and that's two of the things that were they you know that you know was nearly lost by every tribe and so um, there are a lot of people dedicated to the preservation of tribal languages and and you know we try to encourage people to learn um, even a word or two or a little bit or learn how to introduce themselves or um, especially our kids and um, and to let them make those mistakes because they if we don't preserve them then then so much of our culture will be lost the languages are, are an interesting thing because they're so descriptive and one word um, is can be translated when they translate it into English and it can be just this really long two sentences you know <laughs> it's funny uh, somebody was telling me about one of their words was you know for for blueberry pie was this really long word um, that I, I wouldn't even be able to pronounce but it was like you know berries and their juice that's you know in this crust and I don't know but it was like a whole sentence worth and it was just the one word and, and that's like that with um, with a lot of other indigenous languages it may not be you know 20 words like blueberry pie but uh, it really does um, encompass a lot more than that and so I appreciated that she had this exhibit and that we were able to listen to that and that um, that I'm hoping that it'll stir people to to want to hear more and to and, and if you're indigenous or even if you're not indigenous to to maybe want to take up learning a little bit more and learning that language and um, and if you don't feel like learning the language at least supporting those that do so that was a real good one and if you get a chance to go in you know it, it's you know take the time to to listen to these ladies it's a really uh, a powerful a powerful thing even if you don't understand it okay next slide so um the the photographs um the I am your relative and the photographs of all the indigenous ladies um, wearing their t-shirts and their ribbon skirts and you know with with all the the different things on the front of I am and then you know so all the various things uh, that were on the shirts were, were also really powerful you know I am um, not your fantasy i am your relative i am you know there were just so many just really really good statements and i actually wore um you know in solidarity i wore my t-shirt <laughs> strong um resilient indigenous and and uh hung a ribbon skirt up behind me so that you can see that because that's uh it's such a good way to reclaim our power. And that's what mine says on the back, um, reclaim your power. Because, you know, the indigenous women as life givers and nurturers and strong culture keepers, um, 
it was good to see all those photographs of these strong women together and empowering each other and um, holding that space in a traditional and contemporary way and um, wearing those ribbon skirts. I've really seen those make a, a, a real big comeback of, of wearing those as um, ceremonial attire or in, in formal wear and embracing um, the indigenousness yeah, that's, uh, of, of um, themselves, you know, so we're not, we're able to be proud to be indigenous women and um, proud to take these places uh, in society and, and be strong and um, be artists and be directors and be mothers and be students and be artists and uh, be the secretary of interior and wear these ribbon skirts in places where um, they've never been before. And, and the way the, that this particular exhibit was, was, was there and taking up so much space, it just, uh, it was something to be proud of. And then to see on the back, just all the various tribes that all these women were from, um, that we have so much more in common than we do than we do differences, and being able to to come together like that, just as Indigenous women, and, and support each other, was just it was really a, a good a good feeling to see all that. And so, um, when I saw it, I had had seen this picture of Deb Holland. Um, wearing her ribbon skirt and, and her relatives standing there with them with her and theirs and it just really made me feel good and it made me feel good to, uh, and proud um, proud to be an indigenous woman excuse me That's not something that we can, we've always been able to be and uh, proud of who we were created to be and proud of um, proud of our indigenousness. I'm proud to be Lakota. Uh, there has been uh, an incredible amount of shame put on the people through the assimilation practices and the boarding schools and the um, the taking of language and the taking of ceremony and the taking of all that. And when I think about that and who I can be today and who Dem Holland can be today and who Diani Whitehawk could be today. It's because that we survived all of that. And the strong people that came before us held on to that for us and gave it to us so that we can have that and stand in and stand in that. And um it makes me a little emotional to think about it and to be able to sit here and share that with everyone on the the interwebs <laughs> that I am proud of that and, and um, proud to still be able to create and because um, I've seen uh, I've seen how it was for the generation just before me and how oppressed and, and in some ways we you know we still are but every day, uh, I think we, we get a little bit stronger and we pass that down to the next ones and the next ones. And, um, and, and, and we just gotta remain strong and, and, and show the next generation that it's good, that they, don't, that they can be proud of who they are 
I'm proud of these ribbon skirts and proud of this beadwork and proud of our quill work and I'm proud to mix them together with with contemporary things and so uh anyway um anyway it's good to be a it's good to be a Lakota we I'll just say that and we'll move on to the next slide <laughs> Okay, this one, She Gives Quiet Strength. And this whole series was just, wow. Um, it was amazing to see this. So here in, in these, in this particular one, there was movement to me. You know, when I, when I w saw it, I could see that sacred movement in it, the, the, the life in this particular piece and uh, and in some ways the, the way that the lines are and in, in some of the other pieces like it it reminded me of our star quilts and um uh, and the beauty of those and and that geometry in those i saw also in these paintings that you know are beads and quills and um, but painted that way and just thinking wow the quiet strength is right um, because these what it takes to create these I can't even imagine but I can see how much patience that it takes and how much perseverance that it takes and how much uh, persistence that it takes and those are um, those are some of our traditional values that patience that perseverance to continue to create this um, this piece of art and and the other ones like it that looks like the quills and the, um, there there were several in this series and the geometry in them and the lines and the i know that there's more to it and and so i was re reading some of um, the description of what's behind it and the gold and the and the copper and that sort of thing but to me I just was blown away by the patience that it takes to create something like that and I think that that's one of the things um, among indigenous people artists the patience that they have to create any of it is um, is pretty amazing you know, to work with such small beads, such small quills, and to create something bigger than that, bigger than the, the than its parts, it does take that quiet strength to do. And so, again, this particular piece, you know, having a picture of it and looking at the picture of it, absolutely does, you know, doesn't do it justice. Uh, for the brilliance of those colors um, and that depth and that movement and that beauty that's there. And so if you do get to see, if you do have a chance to go really see this piece, it's a really good one. So um, I know we have a few minutes left. And so I don't know if we have some questions or anybody wants to, to touch back on some other things um, but that's really all I had um, on these so. well thank you so much this was so uh, you know I truly appreciate having curated this exhibition hearing how you and the staff at the Kansas City Indian Center um, uh, responded to the work and it was so nice to hear because you know you really talked about um, all of the big points in her practice in Diani Whitehawk's practice so you touched on the moccasins and the significance and importance of those and then the listen and I'm your relative series and really thinking about um, visibility and native erasure in the past and then the carry series carry one two and three and really focusing on this idea of function and the way that native art has been siloed previously and really what diani and a lot of contemporary artists are doing now with um, this 
pushed to have their work seen and respected in the way that we think about art with a capital A. And then I loved how you ended with um, talking about the Quiet Strength series and really thinking about, you know, the ways that these works feel similar to um, things that you've seen before, but then also really highlighting the fact that she's done this with paint. Um, and yes, I think patience is an excellent word. And to do a selfless plug, if you go to uh, Kemper's Instagram page, you can see a video of Diana, just as a short little clip of her um, working on this painting. Um, so I will open it up if anyone has any questions, please feel free, you can type them in the chat or in the Q&A. And Gaylene, would you like, oh, oops, I'm so sorry. Uh, would you like me to go to any particular slide or I can stop sharing? Um, yeah, if you want to stop sharing, that's fine. I don't have a particular slide that. Oh, and I'm sorry. I did all that with my <laughs> camera. <off. laughs> okay, so as we're waiting for people to type in any questions they might have, um, I'll ask you a question. So maybe you could talk a little bit more about the star quilts that you were referring to when you were, um, when you saw the uh, quiet strength, strength she gives seven. Yeah, so um, before, you know, before we had, um, you know, buffalo robes and, and different things like that, that were um, that we used for warmth, but also as um, to honor people, you know. Um, but once the um, we started with the fabric and that sort of thing and the sewing, um, now they make star quilts, which represent the morning star, and so they have kind of those same those same angles. And they they fan out and make these stars from the middle and and you know they've been really uh, people have added their own artistic flair to them you know over over the years and you know they've become excuse me more contemporary uh, you know where before I think they you know would be. Well, I'm sure it was what they had available, you know, so it would just be stars of the same color, you know, so you'd have just like, you know, orange blocks or whatever, but um, now they're just incredible and they're really kind of uh, similar to the, to the ribbon skirts in that, you know, people use the colors that say mean something to them or to their family or to their tribe or whatever like that. And, and I don't think that it's just a Lakota thing anymore. I think people of, you know, other tribes have, are also making them, but I know, um, you know, when babies are born or people get married or when people pass on, make that transition to the next, um, star quilts are given, you know, and they're given to honor people for, um, you know, big times in their life, graduations and, um, if somebody really helped you with something, you know, that would be a, a good, a good gift to honor people, you know, are those blankets. And so um, they are, they do have those geometrical patterns in them, you know, to, to make that star. And so, you know, anytime you can see those in represented in, in this other art, you really, you know, it really kind of reminds me of that. And with the kind of that wavy line that they used to, to, batten down that quilting um, it, it just kind of evoked that that memory of that to me and so and, and I think that's kind of true with so many of her pieces you know she brings out so many uh, of the sh of the geometrical shapes and the um, patterns that I'm used to seeing like all through growing up in um, so much other art and so uh, it was good to see it in, in kind of this different setting and um, and in this different new way. Yeah, I'm I'm not an artist, uh, but but some of my relatives are. My mom's a beater and she does, you know, stuff like that. And so I've seen what it you know what it takes and you know how long some of that stuff 
takes to to work with that and you know the the quills and the and the beads and that sort of thing to to make something beautiful it takes patience and it takes time and it takes um, that kind of loving touch so it's uh, cool to see thank you so much and I'll ask another question. So you came with your staff and did a tour of the exhibition. Is everyone um, that attended the exhibition, are they Lakota? No, um, one of them is Dakota and one of them is Apache. One of them is um, Choct uh, Chickasaw and one is um, Kickapoo of Kansas. Oh, wonderful. And so were there any um, symbols that they recognized or had um, stories that you could share or that they shared with you? I know that, you know, symbols mean different things to different people, like you said, different tribes, even different families, even people within the families. But I'm just wondering if there were any, um, you know, commonalities or any points where um, the people in the tour got really excited about the work. I think um, I think part of it was just uh, just being blown away. One of um, my coworkers, she beads, and I'm gonna do a little. I, I told her to bring her her little hat. Oh, wonderful! So she, she beaded oh this hat, you know, and just around the rim, and then she did this hat band. Um, so she does that stuff, you yeah. know, and she was just anytime there were those those pieces that had you know large pieces of beadwork or or large amounts of beads in it and kind of that abstract uh moccasin one with you know i, I kind of look at it like stained glass it had so many different colors i think it's called all the colors yes and, it is titled all the colors yes yeah uh, and we were just like wow you know look at how many beads that is and you know how long that would take to place all those and you know it's one thing when you're just using one color but when you're like you know using multiple colors and you're just you know she just really i think just the sheer um enormity and undertaking that that some of those pieces were i think that that's just because because she does that kind of work so she really understands it too that you know, those little bitty beads and little bitty, you know, that it's just floor, you know, just floored. <laughs> you know, yeah. like, wow, you know, how long did that take her? <laughs> take her right. And, yeah, uh, that's so nice to hear. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so that, and, and then I think, oh, go ahead. No, no, please, please. I'm sorry. Go ahead. And I think that um, mostly, I think that the staff, they were just talking about uh, just really appreciating some of the um, commonalities this the of uh, you know multiple tribes like with with all the the ribbon skirts and that sort of thing um, just that whole bringing together you know that whole theme along you know through all this work and through that that bringing together so um, it just felt good to, to be able to see that in that space and have that visibility of indigenous art. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. And we want to apologize. It seems that the chat was um, disabled before, but it now should be available. So if anyone has any questions, please feel free to type those into the chat or the Q&A. Um, and I'll be checking those and then reading those out to Kayleen. We have one from a person named Mary. Um, they said, thank you, Gaylene. You have added so much depth to my understanding and appreciation of the exhibition. Oh, well, that's nice. I think you're the same for Mary. And as I give um, people a little time to um, type their questions into the chat, I may be, um, so you talked about the beaded works on canvas and the 
um, sweetheart work and those different um, symbols that you found there. Did you find um, any other symbols throughout the exhibition away from maybe um, Quiet Strength and the Moccasin series that were interesting to you and you wanted to share anything about? I think um, I can't think of any particular symbols that stood out to me, you know, other than, you know, like the, uh, you know, the crosses and I, I think there were some dragonflies and all that, but I think just the way that, um, that she used the beadwork to mirror uh, the paintings. Yeah, I thought that was just a, a really neat use of both those mediums and uh, just seeing that mixed media was, you know, was really enjoyable. That depth. Yeah, wonderful. Thank you. And you talked about depth a lot. I appreciate that in talking about the sides of the canvases. And I think that um, is something that's really wonderful just as you're spending time walking through the galleries and then you look and on the sides of several of the paintings there's the continuation of the paint or even like um i guess what would that be vertical lines that add depth and dimension to the painting so thank you so much for bringing that up thank you Well, Gaylene, I wanted to say thank you so much. This was such a wonderful conversation. Um, we really appreciate it. Oh, we have one um, comment that has come in. It says, great art evokes emotion. Thanks for being open and raw. Makes me so much more invested. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I guess it takes a strong woman to cry, huh? <laughs> Definitely, and I mean, yeah, you're yeah, talking about very you. important. Oh, I'm sorry. I keep cutting you off, please. I'm sorry. Oh, no, you know, I was just saying, you know, that's something that we're always told not to do. You know, we're not supposed to show emotion. We're not supposed to, you know, have have those big feelings. We're supposed to be cool and calm. And you know what? I, I can't. <laughs> I can't do that anymore because some things are just too important for that, you know? And so we just have to be who we are and feel what we feel and you know then uh, it, it shows people what's important to us absolutely yes i agree and i think you said that wonderfully and i think that um lee hopefully i've pronounced your name correctly um their comment is a wonderful place to end so Gaylene thank you so much everyone thank you so much for uh, joining us today and we hope to see you virtually or in person the Annie Whitehawk speaking to relatives is up until May 16th thank you so much and have a wonderful day everyone bye appreciate you thank you bye. so much you are wonderful thank you